answer. Thanks very much for joining. And I would like to introduce Carmen Fernholz. He's an organic farmer from Western Minnesota. He's been involved with growing Kernza and collaborative Kernza research with the University of Minnesota since 2011. Currently, he's working with Colin Puritan in establishing a coordinated cooperative marketing organization structure in Minnesota to provide an inventoried and orderly flow of growing acres and harvested grain onto the market. Thanks, Carmen. Okay, let me see if I can get it up here. That looks good. And uh, is it? Yep, it was the one you were just hovering over. This one. Yep. We're good? Yep. yep. Great. Okay, first of all, I do appreciate the opportunity to be able to present at this uh, webinar. I've been on all the sessions and really found everything quite informative. So I've been asked to talk about uh, Farmer Cooperative for Marketing Kernza. And I know years back when I first connected with Dr. Don Wise about Kernza, one of the biggest questions we always wanted to keep in mind was balancing the production with the utilization. We were always concerned about <clears throat> getting too much product and not enough use or uh, too much use and not enough product and so uh, that's sort of been something that I've been working with and keeping uh, on my mind uh, as this Kearns of production continues to develop. So having said that, my uh, experience with farm cooperatives goes back a, a number of years. But uh, the first thing that really came into my mind when we were looking at developing Kearns is a farmer cooperative for marketing Kearns and the first question is, so why a farmer cooperative? And looking at Kearns as a, absolutely a new uh, player on the block, a, a new crop for farmers, there has to be some kind of a tool to help the farmers not only grow the crop, then of course, but be able to market it as well. And so to meet the needs of these farmers, taking on the, the investment and the risks of a new crop, as well as a new concept in, in crop production and new concept being perennialization. The most experience that any of us farmers have on perennial crops probably is uh, something like alfalfa or pastures, but to produce a, a primarily cash revenue crop through a perennialization process is something totally new. So this obviously raises challenges uh, and uh, needs that have to be met. And so, so what are some of these needs or challenges? The first one, obviously, as I mentioned, is the new concept of perennial. And of course, along with that, then we're talking about the new crop, Kernza. And then what I see is that crop research and development are the focus of researchers, plant breeders, product developers, and their respective institutions. That's what they're function is their primary functions. The co-op to me would be the tool to help grow, harvest, and move a new grain with great, with food grade quality into an economically viable market, reliable, dependable amounts that, that we will have to uh, be able to supply to the market if we're gonna be successful. So that would be the basic reason for the co-op. But looking at it from a farmer's perspective then, what are the agronomic challenges, or as many of us farmers would say, the unknowns? And there are a list of them. I'm going to sort of give, a li give the list and then I'll uh, digress a little bit on some of these unknowns that farmers face. First of all, organic uh, versus non-organic, big question. Do we do organic or, or do we do non-organic? Many of us inexperienced in organic would probably hesitate to move into organic. Rotation sequence, we'll talk a little bit about that. Seed sourcing, where we get it, how we get it. Seeding equipment, uh, seed bed preparation, seeding rate, row spacing, 
optimum seeding times. All of these are challenges and unknowns to us as farmers. Fertility, uh, types and rates of fertility, uh, lodging uh, because of too much fertility, weed management, organic system is obviously different than a non-organic system, and of course uh, herbicides that are, are, aren't allowable. Then optimum harvest time. We know the uh, challenges of shattering and what moisture at which to harvest. Harvesting equipment, straight cut or window, or excuse me, or windrow, and then how we store it post harvest, and finally how we get it from the farm to the market. So just to digress on some of these challenges, um, where can we fit Kernza into a rotation. Uh, I just put together a quick uh, rotation suggested by Randy Anderson from, from Brookings USDA. And quickly, what I'm thinking is when we look at Kernza, the possibility is, is using it in place of alfalfa in a crop rotation. Uh, because we could keep it in hopefully three years for production and then a pasture grazing or forage and so this would be one of many possibilities of where it could be used in a rotation but I think the key here is can we afford to grow a small grain or other cool season crops and according to Dwayne Beck from Dakota Lakes Experiment Station in the studies that he's done net return to farms with that 20 percent acreage in wheat is similar to an entire farm in corn and soybeans. So we know that financially and economically, it would be viable. If we can meet all the other ag agronomic challenges, it's certainly something that we could have in our rotations. So roughly speaking, I think where the currency would fit in best would be following a small grain when we look at the time that it has to be planted. And so uh, in a scenario like this, we can see where turns it could possibly fit in. And I've always looked at rotations as a work in progress. Uh, over the years, <clears throat> my rotations have changed up over time, but it uh, is always a work in progress and a lot of it depending upon uh, the, the rota uh, for function as well as market opportunities for each and every crop that I would have in my rotation. Uh, seeding, Kernza, we know there's a lot of work being done on seeding uh, in my uh, operation. I've been currently looking at 12 to 15 pounds per acre and six row spacings because an organic system I am concerned a little bit about weed suppression. However, on the downside, uh, seeding that close together <clears throat> could pose a, an issue of the currents itself uh, becoming too thick uh, over a shorter period of time and thus impacting my potential yield over a longer period of time. So there's give and take there, obviously. Uh, seeding kerns, uh, my experience has been uh, to keep it shallow, uh, half inch deep. Uh, a lot like any small grain, but not as deep. And then um, a firm seed bed. And what kind of seed bed uh, depends on, on what your uh, tools of equipment or, or equipment are. The uh, tandem disc works good as a seed bed prep or a field cultivator. I like to use a field cultivator with wider sweeps so that in uh, preparing the seed bed, if there are any potential weed pressures, I have a much better chance of uh, at least setting them back or uh, eliminating them with a good pass with the field cultivator. Fertility, I've been doing some uh, experience with fertility, um, uh, spreading a a hog manure prior to planting the, the Kernza in late August, early September, and then after harvesting, uh, 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 spreading over the top, uh, another uh, version of manure with limited rates because I want to be concerned obviously about too much fertility causing too much growth and potential lodging of the grain because as we know, Currently, the currency can grow quite tall. And then weed management. Uh, so far, in my experience, 
uh, with a good stand, we've been able to maintain uh, weed suppression quite well. Um, what I found is it with this picture, this is ferns that was seeded in the fall of uh, 2018, and this picture is taken about uh, about this time in 2019. And we can see the growth here is early and fast, and so it has done a good job of keeping down the weeds as compared to uh, the row crop right next to it, where you can see the candle thistle pressure is already coming on quite strong. This is what the field then looked like uh, right prior to harvest. And I just wanted to point out these, these spots here in the field where we had a, a skip. We didn't drive quite straight enough when we planted the Kernza. And so no Kernza was growing there. And obviously weeds being opportunists took the opportunity to uh, get themselves going. Um, and we know this is what Kernza looked like right before its harvest. We see how tall it can get. And we're also trying to figure out how best to uh, set the combine, uh, harvest date, things of that sort. What I did find out last year is that when these Kernza heads that are straight up do a curve, that it appears that the grain is ready to harvest. And what I watched last year is from straight up to curve can take place in three days or less. And so it, it becomes a, a, a watch and see uh, program. Uh, how to harvest it. I, I experienced and worked with three uh, producers last year uh, and one harvest was uh, windrowing it and combining it. The second one was straight cutting with a draper head. And the third uh, way was with a stripper head. And my experience with all three tells me that I think the stripper head looks to be one of the best ways to do it, not only for efficiency, uh, you can travel six to seven miles an hour, but you can get a pretty good uh, grain in the hopper with a very few, if any, of these green stems because you're just cutting off the very top of the grain. And we know that uh, the grain can be ripe and the stems are still green, so it, it does pose a challenge. I just want to digress on some of those things so that we have an idea of what the challenges the farmers are facing. There are also financial and marketing risks that we're facing, and so it's uh, you know a reliable, robust price discovery, uniform food grade quality, de decreased yield over time, grazing and forage opportunities, as well as orderly and timely shipment of the grain to the markets. Also, we have market logistics, transportation. We have dispersed growers and processors, so that's going to be always a challenge. Limited processing facilities and processor capacity limits. All these things, of course, are being worked on, but right now they do form challenges for us. And then finally, what would be the long-term return on investments, socially, environmentally, and economically, for the farmer to go ahead and invest in growing, um, growing currents? And I want to put all this ahead of you to uh, say that I think a good developed farm co uh, farmer cooperative could go a long way in helping to deal with these challenges. And so what I'm suggesting is something like a National Kerns of Growing Growers Association, uh, a marketing agency in common, common with a governing board made up of growers from each autonomous member co-op. And I'm gonna show you what I've sort of drawn up as a schematic of how this would work. Don't worry about getting all the details uh, because I'll explain it as we go on, but note that the yellow color indicates a give and exchange of information, agronomic information, crop development between the farmers, the co-ops, and the research institutes and the marketers, or excuse me, and the potential markets. The red lines indicate the marketing channels with the, uh, I just put some suggested independent co-ops down on the bottom. And the red lines indicate how the flow of grain to the markets would go. It could go either through the, uh, the National Association, but more than likely, 
between the individual co-op and the markets. And you notice that the red line runs from the co-op through the marketer to the market, indicating that the farmers would not be doing the marketing. They would be putting that responsibility onto a marketer who would, whose major responsibility would be to search out the markets. So uh, with that in mind, let me go a little bit more in detail. Uh, and so the, the National Association will be funded by the grower member co-ops through grower investment and additional revenues that they would generate through the marketing of the grain. And the primary role of the oversight marketing agent uh, association would be production, supply and demand oversight, communication with the members and additional member co-op development. So it's, it primarily becomes a communication responsibility of the association. And how they market assist and supply demand balance. Uh, the overall association would be responsible through feedback from market development firms for managing, expanding of market supply. And through feedback from the institution's uh, research and development, the National Association will enable and transfer agronomic assistance to, to the producers. So the information that comes out from research, the association would get that information to the producers. And by having a handle on that information, be able to, through a quota system, maintain a balanced supply and demand <clears throat> environment knowing how the crop is developing, knowing what the productivity is and how it's increasing over time. And this certainly isn't uh, in stone yet, but I would assume that the, the association goal of uh, be very uh, influential in oversight of licensing and seed distribution, obviously in cooperation with TLI and other uh, license holders. Crop and market development, uh, the National Association, although it's only producers, it, but it informs industry and research through feedback from the growers. And I think this is important because that way academia and the collaboration with industry can use this information to assemble and create ongoing agendas. And especially, I think, an agenda that we've talked about, an agenda item that we've talked about, Mark developing including monetizing the ecosystem services, something that I think we really have to investigate on into the future. And the crop and market development of research and development will continue to expand with current funding. Uh, but I think another piece of that is that with the, the National Association <clears throat> working together, we provide a grower's voice to legitimize and give reason uh, for public and private funding to continue and grow, especially in development of perennial agriculture, including Kernza and hopefully in the future, other forever green initiative crops. So the, that's the National Association. Under that, then we've got the co-op members. And uh, <clears throat> these members, through their joint marketing strategy and revenue producing capability will be will generate the income to maintain the co-op's viability. So real uh, working horses will be the co-op, uh, member co-ops. And the farmers will need to accept some investment uh, responsibility, not necessarily in brick and mortar, but in organizational structure, a personnel, hiring a marketer, <clears throat> things of this nature. Eventually they may want to look at brick and mortar, but initially I think looking at the structure and the personnel. And then other responsibilities, uh, the co-op uh, through the governing boards and marketing agents will be the direct communication link between the association and the members. So the member goes through its local board to communicate with the larger association, the national association. And these members will, and I think here's probably one of the most important pieces of the individual co-ops, and that is <clears throat> to accumulate. They would be the accumulators, the brokers, the handlers, the logistic, logistics facilitators for both the acres and harvested grain. 
So they would be responsible for knowing what is out there and what the potential into the future is for actual product going to the market. Their responsibilities also include oversight on inventories <clears throat> of each member's current acres harvested, the quantities and marketable quality of the grain so that the buyers can come to the co-op and say, okay, what have you got? What is its quality? How much is it in volume? And how can we get it to the market? And finally, uh, the oversight also includes storage facilities because we know that all the grain isn't going to be able to get into the market right out of the field. In fact, probably very little of it. And so it's going to have to be stored. And so as the co-op develops, it will need to work among its members to determine adequate facility. Hopefully a lot of this will be on farm, but because of the dispersed uh, production and uh, processing facilities, accumulation will be critical. So how much of uh, this information we can put together will just help facilitate all the logistics. And then <clears throat> finally, it also includes an inventory of post-harvest processing facilities. We know facilities are out there, but they are again dispersed. So the co-ops will need to know where these are, what capabilities they are, and what accommodations they have that can take in the grain because currently most of them are working only with totes. We hope this can change in the future, but having all of this information accumulated through the co-ops will greatly facilitate the marketing. And so that's a quick uh, flyover of what I would see the co-op uh, being. It's, it's a blueprint. It's certainly nothing uh, written in stone at this point, but it, it is the direction that we initially want to start here in Minnesota with, with the three sections that we already have. And in the final analysis, what I'm looking at is a national association will be successful to the degree that it defines, clarifies, and makes currents of social and markets, currents of social, environmental, and economic ecosystem services being performed and achieved by its growers so that in terms of marketing, a monetary value reflecting the services will become and remain an integral part of the currents of market price discovery. Uh, Alma Leopold said it quite well when he talked about industrial agriculture in the last sentence here, he says, in its extreme form, it is <clears throat> humanly desolate and economically unstable. These extreme forms someday die of their own too much, not because they are bad for wildlife, but because they are bad for farming. And I think Kernza and the Forever Green has an opportunity to change this. And so this is my case uh, for us charged with developing the varieties, researching the applications, overseeing the production, growing the grain and facilitating the market logistics. It is it forever a work in progress team effort of scientists, economists, sociologists, and farmers? And growing Kernza is the right to use and enjoy that possessed directly and without altering it. This is the promise that we've talked about and that is uppermost in my mind. And I think a co-op can go a long ways in making something like this happen. As a term I used earlier this winter in one of the papers I wrote, use of fruit. Working with something, having something, but keeping it unsoiled. That's it. I'm open to questions. Thanks, Carmen. If my video comes up. Can you hear me, Carmen? Yes, I can. All right, great. Um, so I've got a question to kick off for you. Uh, at the Land Institute, we were really, you know, investigating the idea of a co-op uh, back a year or two ago. And uh, one of the pieces of advice that we got was that um, co-ops can't arise until farmers see a, a clear economic benefit to, to, to getting involved in spending their time and their money on it. Um, so until there's a pretty good income potential proven, they're not gonna, um, it wouldn't be smart to anyway, uh, contribute their time and money into something 
Um, of course, there's enthusiasts who will, uh, but to really get enough to make it go, you, you need to have that that pull of of clear economic uh, gain through the, the that that setup. So, I'm just kind of wondering if you agree with that, if or if um, you know, at what point do we realize that we've reached that critical tipping point where um, it's clear to farmers that there's that there's money to be made in this. Right, and, and, and it is a challenge. It's a hard, a hard horse situation, obviously. But what I found with the, what the producers here in Minnesota is that they are very interested and enthused about the Kernza, but they have all the questions that I try to outline here, all the unknowns, but appear very willing to come together and form uh, a unit. And I, I'm, I'm thinking as we come together, form this unit, start sharing information, uh, agronomic as well as markets, that uh, the co-op will almost through default form itself. And I'm saying this just based on the questions because uh, to a person, uh, when I get calls about turns and they say, so how are we gonna market it? And I say, well, I think we're gonna have to look at some kind of co-op and say, yes to a person to say, yes, we have to work together as a co-op to make this function. And uh, for obvious reasons, number one, it's a totally new crop. And secondly, we have to be able to find the markets. And none of those individuals knows even where to start to find the markets. So I see they, I think they see a, a dependency on the need for a co-op simply because of all the unknowns. So I'm in short, uh, short answer, I'm optimistic that the farmers will want to, to do currency because they see its benefits, but they will know that it's something you will have to do together. We do have a question came in from Jose. Um, not sure who the best person to answer this question is, but I'll put it out there. What kind of marketable grain qualities would members of the co-op have to be concerned with? Only protein and moisture or other things? What's, what's your take on that? My take on that is looking at the what I uh, worked with last year, um, one of the one of the uh, characteristics I think that the co-op can provide is the variability in threshing quality, uh, which I think is impacted quite a bit by uh, the equipment used. I think uh, the other thing is we do have some issues with uh, ergot and don and things of this nature. So to me, the responsibility of the co-op would be to have a reliable sampling of each producer's uh, production so that when they want to put this out on the market, they would have reliable information so the buyer would know what they would be getting. So to me, that would be an, a, an absolute function of, of the co-op to, de to determine the quality of the grain. Because I see a lot of variability in that quality simply because of uh, geographic location of the grains. And so if we can provide something like that, uh, I think uh, another reason for the benefits of the co-op. All right, great, Carmen. Thank you for your contribution today. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen, we'll, we can bring up our next speaker's okay. uh, screen too. Excellent. Yeah. I, I see there's a couple more questions, uh, Carmen, that have okay. come in on the Q&A. If you could go visit those and I click the type answer and type an answer to those folks. Everyone can see your answer if you wouldn't. Will you. do. Great, thanks a lot. You bet. Thanks, Carmen. Okay. All right, next um, we have another grower. So Brandon Kaufman of McPherson County, Kansas is a producer of niche products. Currently he and his wife have three children and it's become, the mis his, become their mission to find a better way in agriculture for the future generations. Brandon is a co-founding co member of Sustainagrain LLC, which is working with many different in many different realms of the Kernza world. I see you, Brandon. Can you hear me clearly? Yep. yep. My name is... Oh, froze for a second. Like you said, and I'm with Stanley Grant and 30 miles south of Salina, uh, which hey, is where hey, you're Brandon. Yep. Perhaps you should stop sharing your video because 
Your voice is breaking up too much. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. just, try just speaking. We'll see how that works. Yep, go ahead. If you can't hear me, let me know and I'll turn off my video and maybe we can stream. Yes, turn, um, off, so, turn off your video. Yeah, we're 30 miles south of Salina. All right, Tessa, thank you for asking me to present a little bit today. I would also like to thank you for all your work and that you've done in helping to facilitate uh, the commercialization of Kernza. Your extra efforts go, don't go unnoticed. I also want to say thank you to everyone else who is putting maximum effort into Kernza, which in my mind is a better way for agriculture. The topic I was given for my talk today was regional coordination of Kernza. This is quite a large opportunity to discuss various challenges and opportunities we faced along the way. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I got to this point and a snapshot of local agriculture. I was raised locally here on a small grain farm uh, where my dad raised uh, fallow deer and Rocky Mountain elk. Uh, the venison from both have been sold across three decades now, uh, mostly online. And I think this is where I got my itch for niches. After playing intercollegiate athletics and earning a bachelor's degree uh, in chemistry, I uh, found myself continually coming back to the farm and uh, uh, helping with harvest, cattle, or anything else that might need done. And it was ingrained in my blood. So along the way, I received an opportunity to supposedly take over a large commercial grain and beef operation with my wife and three children. After seven years, it was obvious this place was not for me in this form of agriculture as the rural Midwest on a very slippery slope. Many of us can see that the rural landscape is changing at a very rapid pace and young people like myself are facing a difficult challenge in finding our footing in the space. This experience gave me lots of knowledge and pushed me to find something that the large commercial scale is failing to see, profit. I had to find a way to be different since I was small. I have attended many seminars and conferences in holistic farming, no-till, and farming biologically. These were experiences that allowed me to start to think outside the box. I figured out that niches were the only way for me. And with moving exclu exclusively to non-GMO, I found premiums in seed and food grade products. None of these has been easy. And going against the grain from those around you certainly creates more challenges. But in the end, dif uh, being different leaves room for profitability. Fortunately, along the way, I met Brandon Schlotman through family ties and together walked into the Kernsey Arena and founded Sustaina Green. Having a good understanding of what the rest of ag looks like has been challenging for me because of the perceived misconceptions of how things should be easy and there's always a manual or someone out there who has done it previously that can help. As you all know, this is precisely not how kernels of production works. On the other hand, knowing what traditional agriculture looks like has given me a way to look at kernels as something that should be different as we try to commercialize it. How do we stay away from those slippery slopes of mainstream ag and make sure that the way Kerns of commercialization proceeds doesn't turn into a rat race like everything else? Sustainable grain is currently growing both transitional and organic grain production in monocultures, bicultures, and polycultures, as well as working closely with the Land Institute and in growing certified seed of this generation and of future generations. We have been testing and working to develop many markets across the country, and we're finding that it is going to be essential to, to collaborate and cooperate with other Kernza growers in the logistics of Kernza grain production, processing, and handling across the central plains to be able to create a sustainable Kernza supply chain that companies can rely on as a dependable Kernza source. Growing Kernza is difficult, as is the handling the processing and the marketing. Not one person can figure it all out on their own. I realize this is a relatively new arena, but I think it's very important that there becomes a central database of knowledge to help producers. Kerns of production is not for the faint at heart and is not for the highly leveraged producer that needs a government safety net or a line of credit to operate. I tell potential growers this in the first five minutes of a conversation. Don't expect it to be easy and don't expect a government welfare safety net. And until we figure things out, don't expect to make much money. 
We know that every environment is, diff is different across the country. Much of the research in Salina at the Land Institute is done along the Smoky River, and we all know how special river basin soils are. In the Northeast, you have extremely deep soils and high organic matter and plenty of rainfall. Then there's the rest of the country, like Kansas, yearning to grow the crop with much different soils and conditions. Let's talk about fertility on low organic matter soils. What are its true needs? How does anyone know? And if you do, we would love for you to email me at sustainagrain at gmail.com. Help us uh, navigate our way through these uh, fertility challenges. Who is putting data together and sharing this with growers on best management? Virtually the only way I have found any success is by an enormous amount of failure and losing money along the way. If I didn't believe in the system and the direction that moves agriculture, I think I would have quit long ago. I will say that I think we are in a tremendously opportune time to find producers willing to try something new like Kernza, as sour as the mainstream commodities are now. With that being said, we cannot all experience the same failures and we cannot all continue to lose money trying because many will not accept nor can they afford multiple failures. Most new Kernza growers are going to try to want to grow Kernza on their least productive, most degraded acres. The acres they feel like they can afford to try something new on because they never make any money there anyhow. Uh, we definitely made this mistake along the, the way ourselves and we do not want others to continue to go down this road to certain failure. Growing Kernza on degraded acres without access to synthetic fertilizers is a dead end. Synthetic fertilizers are the only reason annual wheat production is still possible on these soils. We shouldn't expect Kernza to be able to do better initially. I would love to see some sort of collaborative database with nutrient needs, tissue samples, soil samples, plant sap analysis, and dozens of other helpful data indices to provide growers with an understanding of what to expect with kerns of fertility. The reason that we can grow stable annual crops so well without risk of regular grower failure is that coordinated efforts and literally billions of dollars have been invested to make sure failure is not an option. We know everything about those crops. We know their nutrient needs, their physiology. We understand how they respond to certain soils. And we have, a variety, and we have varieties adapted to very specific growing regions. We need regional coordination to start pooling information. We need farmers to work together to generate these data sets. And why is this so important? We're, we are not researchers. We do not want to test hypotheses. We want recipes. Growers want a place they can go to, to find markets and get it done in the day. When we want to learn about how to harvest, handle, and process Kernza, we want to learn it in a day, in a conversation. When it comes to plant nutrition, we want to see symptoms in our field, go to our database, and learn what's wrong, and address that fertility problem immediately. Sustainagrain is ready to start leading some of this coordination. If you are a grower and are interested in talking more, coordinating with us and finding solutions to these problems, please contact us by email. But as growers, we need more help. Scientists and investors, we need your help. We can find growers, we can organize growers, we can try to convince those growers to invest the same amount in soil and plant tissue testing um, that we are. But critical digital infrastructure is needed and capital to pay for ongoing soil and tissue sampling would go a long way and helping to solve these problems. Kernza fertility management is the biggest challenge I see facing growers right now, especially growers in regions with degraded soils, um, and especially when the majority of Kernza markets are organic. We have been really struggling with fertility here, and it's sad to see a crop stunted in the field, begging for nutrients. Nitrogen is our main nutrient challenge, and nitrogen is not a challenge in most conventional systems. We are moving through cycles where it takes at a minimum, minimum an entire year to learn whether or not the fertility practice we have tried has been a success or failure. We don't have years to figure this out. If we have all brought Kernza into the commercial arena and then and the commercial arena might not wait for us to figure out how to grow it if we don't act immediately. I guess the easy button for a lot of growers, especially growers with high organic matter soil, would be to mineralize the soil with steel steel and vertical tillage, but that's another topic. I mentioned earlier about not wanting the government to get their fingers involved. I think there are many others that 
want to let Kernza be economically sustainable without subsidies and direct payments. I feel there are many in the arena that would agree mainstream agriculture's largest problem in the last 50 years has been the government's inability to keep their fingers out of the marketplace and allow the systems to stand on their own. Now I'm probably going to step on some toes here, but I want to ask a question. Should we allow a government label of certified organic or non-GMO or regenerative or whatever dictate the beginning markets of Kernza? As a long-term no-tiller and living adjacent to the famous Flint Hills, I understand and it has been ingrained into my mind that we cannot lose any more soil, none. Fact is that in less than a century, there are fields here in Kansas, the breadbasket of the world, that there are no longer in production and may never be again. This should be unspeakable. Last year in a region where we, we see tillable dryland farm ground go for 3000 to as high as $4,500 an acre in recent years, I watched two pieces of land adjacent to a dairy bring less than $1,000 an acre because the soil was gone. Even after thousands of tons of extremely fertile manure from that dairy have been hauled over it throughout the decades. Even after the government conservation programs, terraces and waterways band-aids were put on this field, the fact is there is virtually no soil left to be farmed on that field. We took one of the few assets that the IRS says is not depreciable and we depreciated it all the way by putting steel in the ground and sending the soil to the Gulf of Mexico. So my concern is that as we market this perennial as it is, because of all that perennials bring and we discuss carbon sequestration and water infiltration, and soil bulk density, and all the ecosystem services that it brings, not to mention the ecosystem services markets that are soon to come, how then can we, in good conscience, use tillage as part of the system? We know that one tillage pass can release 10 years of carbon in a CRP field. I understand that we all have to pick our disruptions, just as Mother Nature did. Some choose synthetic disruptions, others choose tillage. Some or all may be necessary at times, but I firmly believe that whichever is used, it cannot be reused repeatedly and in sequence. In the instance of Kernza, are we going to chase yields with consistent use of vertical tillage and oxidation with fire? What message are we sending? And who are we then? And what slippery slope and ag are we approaching? So as we begin to form market shares and let the consumer tell us what they may or may not want, are we willing to allow a government main label to describe our system? Or as terms of commercialization is in its infancy, are we going to tell our own story of a system which is truly sustainable and regenerative? I've seen some of the most successful producers in America tell their own story of how they grow things without labels and they build multiple profitable enterprises around a Keystone Enterprises. In this instance, Kernza is the Keystone Enterprise. Are growers willing to think outside the box and create a market with the truth? And are we going to sell carbon sequestration on Monday and Tuesday and intensively till on Thursday and Friday? Is organic production everywhere going to allow us to regenerate the soils? I can't tell you how excited I am to move um, as much of my production to organic as possible. But if I farm or degraded soils and I have to spoon feed them nutrients, even after decades of no-till and cover crops, my soils need nutrient fertility and lots of it. My microbial products don't work well for me because I don't have the organic matter and the active carbon to feed them. What do you do in a field with 1% organic matter? We have been spending what most farmers would consider silly amounts of money on composted manure for our kerns of field, and they still are severely nitrogen deficient. Other organic nitrogen options like fish are even more expensive. Does someone have the answers for me in this environment? If I don't have a reasonable carbon pool, then how do I efficient, effectively proceed? Please email me with any suggestions at sustainagrain at gmail.com. I think we need to begin facing uh, the real difficult question is, am I building soil carbon if Kernza is nitrogen deficient? What additional level of carbon sequestration and soil regeneration could I achieve with strategic applications of synthetic fertility products? Am I building soil carbon if I till before and after in my Kernza rotation? By no means am I opposed to any specific certification, but I believe we need to be very conscious about the end goal of what we are marketing. 
I would love to have soils that could sustain themselves and more importantly, a system that uses Kernza to regenerate the land. But as a farmer, I cannot afford to grow something organically without tillage or without an efficient sufficient nutrients if it is going to compromise the long-term resiliency of my fields. Right now, we need to build robust Kernza markets for Kansas Kernza grain production uh, with synthetic nitrogen inputs because the soil where Kernza is being grown need nitrogen to rebuild carbon pools. The markets themselves need steady supplies of Kernza grain and new Kernza growers have so many other challenges that nitrogen limitation should not be another one of them. I realize that might not be the message that everyone wants to hear, and that is not the message that Sustainable Grain wants to hear. We have almost 200 acres of Kernza intercropped uh, with legumes right now because we are dreaming of low input carbon neutral nitrogen fertility in our fields. But right now there are millions of acres of vulnerable soils that need to be planted to Kernza, and there are thousands of farmers that need to learn to grow it. Let's let the other challenges be the limitation to Kernza uh, widespread adoption. Let's make sure that we can adopt the innovation, innovations that breeders at the Land Institute and everywhere else are making as fast as possible so that we can address the problems like the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, problems caused by millions of acres of aggregated soil loss. 10,000 acres of Kernza sounds like a lot, but it doesn't touch that problem. We need millions. Our vision is to transform agriculture perennially, but let's make as much progress as we can annually. I'll see you next year and I thank you for your time this morning. Please, please, please reach out to us at Sustainagrain via our email, sustainagrain at gmail.com if you have any innovative ideas in this process, uh, would like to become a regional grower, or would like to pur purchase um, sustainable turns of the products. Um, I've got a few slides I just briefly want to show and then I'd like to open it up for questions. Can you uh, see our slides? Yep. It's, yeah, it's not in a presenter mode, but we can see them. Okay. So here's an email. Um, here's a monoculture field of Kernza. This is first year. I mean, this was one of our home runs. We've had many, many failures and we've had some successes along the way. Um, this was uh, last fall and we're looking forward to our second har our last summer, second harvest here in about a month on this field. Um, this was the way we harvested it last year, and we're working with AGCO to try and find uh, here in Heston, which is seven miles down the road, um, additional ways to become successful harvesting it. Um, here's grazing it this spring, um, doing intensive mob grazing. Um, you can see on the left, on that far left cow, she's kind of split in half. Um, the left side would be where it was grazed of her, and the right side would be opening up to a new paddock on, on uh, that morning. Um, but this was the first year of being able to graze, and I was tremendously excited about it. I think it opens up, um, you talk about the systems approach, I think it opens up lots of opportunity with the forage and when you integrate livestock and other ruminant animals to the system. Here's my daughter again, the left is been grazed, the right is the new paddock. Here's my son post harvest in the summer, obviously poor forage quality, um, but I'm looking to intercede that um, with legumes and some other things that we're doing. Uh, crabgrass has been an accident, but I think it's gonna provide some um, benefits um, for cattle in the summer for higher forage quality. Again, here's fall grazing, you can see the crabgrass. Um, so here's uh, the two ways that we've seeded Kernza, an organic field and it had uh, a high rainfall event. As you know, our rainfall events are sporadic, and when they come, they're heavy on the right. On the left is no tilling into corn residue. Um, here's some no-till after full season soybeans, which we didn't think we thought would be too late with our soybean harvest, but it seems to be working. Um, no-till alfalfa, um, no-till kernza with uh, inter cropped alfalfa. So we have 10 inch spacing here of, of alfalfa, two rows of alfalfa and the third row is Kernza. And this is the year two. And here's another picture in the spring. 
Um, here was a little experiment we did, um, no-tilling Kernza into an existing alfalfa stand. Um, learned a lot from it, but you can see um, the alfalfa there. This is, we went ahead and boycotted it and uh, turned it to forage. Here's some more intercropping stuff that we've done. And uh, here's a picture with my son, likes to fish. They like to dig a worms. They're enthused with the soil. Um, removing one cow pie and taking a pliers. It has a four inch handle on it. That is after, you know, this was on a very degraded field and I talked my dad into letting us try it on this field. You know, we couldn't raise 20 bushel beans. We couldn't raise 60 bushel corn. Let's try Kernza, what do we have to lose? Um, and after 18 months of Kernza, um, two rotations of cattle, I mean, that's like 25 or 30 worms underneath one cow pie dug up with a pliers. Um, so we're beginning to regenerate the land. Um, but how do we get to a system that's like this on a little bit larger scale is where we're interested. Here's that field that did so well. Here's, um, you can see this spring where we grazed in last summer. Um, I think it's gonna yield fairly well. And we added uh, about 60 pounds of nitro nitrogen with composted manure. But even after the cattle going through there, you can see every green spot um, that we're getting um, from the, uh, what's coming through the cows. And so is that nitrogen? Is that some other intrinsic uh, nutrient that we're, that cows bring to the system? We don't know. We need help trying to figure this out. Um, but certainly nitrogen is part of our issues and our deficiency. And here's again our contact information. Inf Information. So if you have any questions, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Great. Thank you, Brandon, for that uh, great presentation. Yes, we do have a little time for questions. Uh, if anyone wants to submit one, go to the bottom of your screen there where it says Q&A and you can type a question in for Brandon. Um, I've got, a, got one to, to start off here, Brandon. Um, you showed an area where you grazed this spring and uh, I'm curious, uh, do you have heads out there now? Um, here, uh, my ungrazed plots, at least, uh, were in the heading stage. We even got uh, pollen shed happening here in, in Salina. So what's that field look like now? Yeah, it's, uh, it's pollinating right now. Um, one of the things we notice when we have low fertility is, is how much further behind it is in the uh, maturation process. Um, those spots that were lush green, you can see those cow pies and those urine spots, you know, those were heading weeks ago, you know, it was incredible. And the height difference is starting to even out now. Um, but yes, where we grazed, um, and I was watching it pretty close with the um, stem elongation when that head was coming out. And so, I mean, I could just open the gate and we were off in, in 10 minutes, you know, checking it daily. Um, but yeah, um, but how do we get consistently with that across the field um, with that fertility on the cows, you know? Um, it's hard to put 100 and 200,000 pounds of of, of uh, density on there grazing well, you got to breed for cows that, that walk while they pee yeah and they have a spreader on the back end <laughs> exactly <laughs> um got another question for you here from jose did you see a yield difference between the no-till planting into corn residue or other annual crops versus the tilled organic system how did you terminate the five-year-old alfalfa stand before planting the currents into it so um, our greatest success was following a corn crop. I don't know why exactly. Um, and we've also had some failures following a corn crop. Um, the mineralization on that organic field, I think we had plenty of nitrogen. The problem was when we got that rain event, this field had uh, uh, terraces and waterways, uh, which we had buyers out. I was explaining them to what a terrace does, what a waterway does, you know. You know and uh, we got that rain event and everything was gone. I mean, we had nothing left. So we go in and reseed, you know, and then you're at mother nature's mercy again. Um, what was the rest of your question? I don't know if I addressed uh, all of it. So, so was there a yield difference between those? I don't know if you had any harvest on them or. We, we had very minimal harvest on the, uh, the organic field the first year because we had, I mean, we brought up such a flush of weeds that we couldn't control it. We couldn't get ahead of them. We had cool season weeds and then we had warm season weeds and it created an incredible disaster at harvest, um, which is one of the reasons we're trying to partner with Agco or use some of their um, equipment to uh, harvest differently. 
with a pickup head. Um, but yeah, our best field was certainly the monoculture following corn. Um, but I think we didn't see the nitrogen deficiency that we're seeing this year on that field, even after we applied supposedly 60 pounds of nitrogen from a composted manure. So the question was, uh, how did you terminate the alfalfa before you planted? We did not terminate the alfalfa. We seeded directly into it. Um, I think there's some options learning growing going forward. You know, do you have an existing alfalfa stand and then you terminate strips and interseed? You know, you use it as a nitrogen source A. B, you use it as weed suppression between the rows of Kernza. Um, we've also looked at the other side of that as, um, you know, maybe A, we get Kernza established, solid seeded year one to compete with the weeds. Year two or three, we come back and we figure out how to strip legumes or you know, whatever polyculture in. A, you know, we want to get grain production going. B, we want to figure out the system and do those sequentially. So were you able to get the, the kerns established in that alfalfa without killing it? Yeah, we were. Um, the problem was my dad thinks that he wanted all the biomass. I haven't transitioned his mindset yet. <laughs> and so he was continually hammering it, taking off. You know, he wanted to get the first cutting alfalfa off before the kerns came. Okay, so we did that. And we're probably okay. Well, then after we tried to harvest it, which was a, a wet mess, um, then he wanted to take the biomass off, which, which is fine. Um, but then two more times last summer, he thought he needed to do that. And there just wasn't enough now to, to continue down that road. But it was, it was incredible to see what had withstood all that pressure, was, was very robust, and uh, just wasn't, the, wasn't enough there to continue down that, that experience. So the continued cutting managed to kill the, the kerns of plants pretty much. It, it, it just, yeah, it, it put it back so far it just couldn't. And that was on an irrigated field uh, with center pivot irrigation over the top. So even with the water, you know, when you're continually short, shortening the root system like that, um, it just couldn't. You know, and granted, the, the alfalfa, that's probably a five or six year, alfa, year old alfalfa stance, you know. So look at its root system compared to um, the root system that a six month old Kernza plant's got right. and having to slough off every time it cuts, gets cut. Great, thank you very much, Brandon. Appreciate thank you. your time today. Um, all right. And now we're gonna hear from a little bit from the Land Institute. Um, Spencer Berryball is the perennial legume technician at the Land Institute and works with project leader Brandon Schlotman to investigate and develop new perennial legume species for grain and intercropping systems. He holds a bachelor's degree in horticultural science from the University of Minnesota. And so, um, yeah, we might get more about the alfalfa intercropping here. Okay, can you hear me and see my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Spencer Baraball. I work at the Land Institute um, as the perennial legume technician uh, under Brandon Schlotman. Um, I'll be talking to you mostly today about our kind of flagship uh, perennial legume intercropping with uh, Kernza experiment um, that you can see in the background here. Uh, so first, to kind of go over the steps in our program, step one, we want to develop a crop and cropping system model. Um, so once you kind of decide on that, that system, you need to develop some agronomic practices uh, in step two, and then identify your barriers to adoption uh, to inform your, your research and breeding goals. Um, a lot of work is, was done by Tim Cruz at the Land Institute on uh, looking at the soil ecology of intermediate wheatgrass and alfalfa. And so that was our first um, uh, suggestion uh, was to use something established like alfalfa. Um, and so there, it's kind of a two um, goal uh, cropping system. So grain and forage production. Um, and then we took it a step further and we're looking to screen um, existing alfalfa varieties, germplasm, uh, for their compatibility in the system. Um, <clears throat> the first goal of this 
trial was uh, to look at the intermediate wheatgrass crop growth and development, um, maybe look at uh, developing crop calendars using index values. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, small grains, um, these are uh, values that are pretty common um, across all uh, cool season grasses. Um, the second objective uh, was can you uh, do spring grazing and haying um, in order to increase your biomass uh, yields? Um, when can you do it? What's your grain trade-off? Um, the third uh, goal uh, was legume intercropping. Uh, so how does a secondary species come in and uh, change the overall system of the wheatgrass? Um, and four, is there genetic variation in the alfalfa uh, that we can begin to breed our own varieties uh, for intercropping into the current zone? So this is a crop calendar, um, so to speak, for intermediate wheatgrass um, using growing degree days. If you're not familiar with those, it's kind of the accumulation of heat units per day. Um, that drives the different growth stages. Um, so this is an example from 2018. Um, stem elongation happened around 1500 growing degree days, boot stage uh, at 2500, um, and thesis or pollen shed at about 3000, uh, and then harvest uh, at about 4500. Um, after multiple years of doing this, you can get um, an idea of how the environment plays a role in uh, how many growing degree days uh, each of these stages takes. Um, why is it important? Well, when you're just growing it by itself, um, you've got uh, pretty consistent uh, growth and development, but if you throw in alfalfa, how does it change? Here in Kansas, um, the alfalfa seemed to um, perform well in the spring, um, but as the light penetration and the canopy decreases for the alfalfa, um, the leaves start falling off, uh, the forage quality of the alfalfa um, declines pretty rapidly. Um, and then yeah, after summer grain harvest, uh, your light penetration uh, increases substantially and it can begin to regrow. Um, so here's a combination of the two years of our uh, study with alfalfa. Um, the overall trend was that uh, the growth and development of the wheatgrass was not affected by the intercropping, but rather uh, just the year in itself. Um, so combination of the temperature uh, and rainfall gradient of that year. Um, there's some consistent patterns. Um, so you can kind of use this as a grower to predict uh, certain stages uh, for your kerns of growth. Um, alfalfa intercropping uh, did not significantly affect head mare stem growth rates in the first two years. Um, this is a, an example of how tall the, the head gets um, from April to uh, harvest. And in the uh, bottom left is probably the most important uh, part of this equation. Um, if you're going to spring graze, you're gonna be grazing um, around 500 to 750 growing degree days, but you don't wanna cut off those head and mare stems. Um, Growing degree days was significant uh, in affecting leaf stem and head biomass partitioning, uh, but the intercropping didn't affect it. Um, so what we did here was uh, on a weekly basis, we took um, 200 tillers, divided them into leaves, stems, and heads, and monitored their dry weights. Uh, and you can see in both years, um, the, this is a fraction, so um, numbers below one. Uh, the leaves are the biggest at the beginning until stems emerge or elongate, uh, and then um, heads begin to emerge later on in the year. Um, we took those tissues, leaves, stems, and heads, 
of the intermediate wheatgrass um, on a weekly basis for 16 weeks. Um, we submitted them for tissue samples. Uh, at the bottom here, you can see which tissue uh, or which nutrients we screened for. So we did the whole uh, list of everything you could really test for carbon, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, uh, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, copper, iron, manganese, and zinc. Um, and I'll show a little bit um, of those nutrient results here. So left and right was first year Kernza and second year Kernza. Um, the fertilizer um, in the first year didn't um, seem to affect anything, but in the second year, uh, the leaves had higher nitrogen content for a longer period of time. And that equates to uh, higher uh, forage quality. Um, but overall, just having different varieties of alfalfa didn't seem to significantly affect the nitrogen content in the leaves. Um, that kind of suggests that in the first two years, at least, um, the nitrogen recycling isn't rapid enough uh, to really make a, a, a difference. Um, we also did it in the stems, and you can see that uh, it, it, it's kind of, um, it fluctuates a lot because the stems are kind of the highway for the nutrients. Um, there's a little bit of a trend difference between year one and year two. Year one, uh, the nitrogen content seemed to be stable at two and a half percent or so. Whereas in year two, uh, there was a large drop in nitrogen content. This, we don't know why. Um, it could be that nitrogen was all used up uh, in the first year. Um, and, and so it, the Kerns just really didn't have enough uh, nitrogen to move into the heads. Um, here's a, a graph of the nitrogen content in the heads. Uh, a similar um, trend that the first year, uh, the nitrogen content was stable. Um, and then in the second year, it starts off really high uh, and then drops off pretty rapidly uh, and ends lower than the first year did. Um, we don't, again, we don't know why, um, but these are kind of our first snapshots into what's going on in the leaves and the stems and the heads um, for all of these nutrients. So at objective two, um, we looked at spring defoliation. Um, we didn't actually graze, but um, we, we used mechanical uh, defoliation. Um, it seemed that you could at least uh, do this at about the third leaf stage and not harm uh, the mare stems. Um, the mare stems here, uh, you might be able to see where the arrows are pointing. Uh, they kind of look like uh, rattlesnake tails. Um, this was taken in early May, uh, maybe the last week of April. Um, there's large variation in the length, so the soil level um, is at the bottom, um, and finding these is rather difficult uh, in the first couple of weeks of stem elongation, but this is the critical growing point that can't be cut off if you want that tiller to remain reproductive. Um, and so how, how many of these tillers or mare stems can you cut off and still get um, the same grain yield uh, that season? Uh, here's an example of what happens uh, when you cut too many of them off. Um, we did a weekly study where we cut, um, beginning in April, we cut the entire plot um, every seven days. And uh, this picture was taken about four days ago. Um, the void here was a late cutting in uh, middle of May. Uh, there's hardly any heads. There's not a lot of biomass. Um, we were obviously, this would be way too late to have cut, um, but the uh, plots on the outside are uh, the largest um, amount of heads that were left uncut. Um, so there's got to be a sweet spot 
for spring grazing or cutting. Uh, this would be a, a biomass accumulation. Um, the, if you were to cut, um, that last picture would, would have been the May 13th uh, cutting this year. Um, but you've got um, a lot of biomass in the spring, but your grain yields um, are pretty low, if, if not non-existent. Um, and so we're still working out the finer details on what, how late you can cut. Um, here's some of the effects of grain yields um, based on when you cut, um, April to uh, May 13th. Um, if you left it uncut, you've got moderate yields. Um, if you cut it uh, late April, you seem to have, it, it suggests you could increase your grain yield. Um, and it could be a condition of the lodging that year. We had a lot of lodging um, in the no cut, uh, in the early cut uh, dates. Um, and then the spike counts are really the tell, tell sign of how much grain you're going to get. Uh, the latest cutting, we basically had no heads or spikes. Uh, the, re the rest of the cuttings and the no cut had about the same amount, um, but the yield differences were uh, um, not significant uh, in the early cuttings. Uh, so a little bit more about the alfalfa itself. Um, we want to know how much alfalfa is produced in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, what is compatibility? Compatibility includes uh, forage quality uh, when planted in between rows of Kernza, um, can be affected by the shading of the wheatgrass. Um, so we took 26 varieties. Uh, some are commonly grown uh, varieties in Kansas, some are Northern, some are Southern uh, United States varieties. Uh, we looked at the variation uh, in the NIR data, which encompasses crude protein, acid detergent fiber, uh, neutral detergent fiber. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll share some of the uh, results here. We planted on uh, in the fall of 17. So this is our third uh, season of it. Um, there, these are six graphs. Uh, the top year uh, is 2018 and the bottom is 2019. The most important thing to look at is the ratio um, of brown to green bars. Um, the brown is the wheatgrass and the green is alfalfa. Um, you can see the first year the alfalfa is, is trying to establish, the Kernza is out competing it um, and it really takes a, the second year for the alfalfa to even um, establish itself in the spring. Uh, but by the fall, uh, the regrowth of the alfalfa is a lot higher um, than the, the Kernza. Um, so that's a good sign that it's still there, even though it was outcompeted um, in the first two years, basically. Um, These are all the varieties that we tested. Um, there's a trend in uh, varieties producing more um, biomass. Uh, there, there really isn't a grain yield effect, which is pretty significant uh, finding that um, you can plant alfalfa at, at least in these past two years, uh, and we didn't find any grain yield uh, suppression uh, from that, um, and why why is adding alfalfa important? Well, in the spring, uh, let's say you can get fifteen hundred pounds and return fifty five dollars uh, an acre. Um, that same amount of forage is not worth a whole lot in the summer uh, because everybody has forage in the summer. It seems. And so your price drops from $55 a return to $2.50. Um, so you'd, you've also got to consider the, the forage 
quality itself is really poor in the summer for, for Kernza. Uh, so the alfalfa might increase uh, the return there. Uh, and how would it do it? Well, the crude protein uh, is the first indicator of forage quality. Um, on the left is the wheatgrass crude protein. And on the right is the alfalfa. Um, it, it's a little out of order um, from fall, spring to summer. Um, but the lowest quality is in the summer. The, the wheatgrass is stable at about 5%. Uh, crude protein. Um, and then in the spring and fall, it's between 15 and 20 percent. Um, and that's to be expected because we only used one variety of wheatgrass. Uh, whereas in alfalfa, we use the 26 varieties. Um, and you can see, I don't have uh, the spring in here from 2018, but the variation in crude protein um, amongst the 26 varieties. There's not a clear uh, winner, but there is uh, some clear losers uh, that aren't performing well with the competition. Um, and so the main takeaway is we can, uh, as a breeding program, select some of these varieties that, that are performing well over the three years, um, choose some individual plants, make some crosses, uh, and, and use this as a selection tool uh, to better improve the, the crude protein. Um, this is a similar graph uh, with acid uh, detergent fiber. Lower values are better uh, as the fiber is indigestible at higher rates. Um, the, the wheatgrass was stable across the three um, or across all the treatments. Uh, but different across the cuttings, fall to spring and summer. Um, but the variation in the alfalfa um, allows, again, the breeders to make decisions on some of the better performers uh, in order to make crosses. Um, so we've already kind of touched on uh, objective four, which is identify variation among the 26 alfalfa varieties. Um, so we're going to start working on getting some uh, breeding uh, germplasm going, making crosses with those. Um, this is a picture of sandfoin and Kernza growing right now. Um, the Kernza is doing well in this plot. Uh, the sandfoin is uh, also doing well. You can see a lot of flowers. Um, so that's, that's going to be another objective of ours uh, to begin looking at at a different legume species. Uh, so it was a lot of information, but the biggest thing is uh, this was kind of the first glimpse at the micro and macronutrient concentrations of alpha uh, Kernza from April to July. Um, Brandon Kaufman mentioned a lot about tissue testing and where fertility should be. Um, Tissue testing is pretty expensive for one leaf tissue test for all of those nutrients, it's about $26. Um, and so you're trying to make it feasible for a farmer to know what that number means. And so if you, you spend that kind of money per acre um, and you've got a wide possible variation, does it actually mean anything when you get that number back? Um, so we're, we're going to use these uh, results uh, to kind of give us that first glimpse into what, what range it can possibly be. Um, other uses are water soluble content. Um, we can extract crude protein uh, formula without doing an IR just by knowing the nitrogen content. Um, the, the age of the stand is also important. Uh, you can't just do it the first year. Um, and we're, we're now on our third year, so we'll see what the, the story is um, going into this third year. Um, and finally, you can use mineral tonnage removed per bale uh, to give you an idea of how many uh, you know, tons of phosphorus that you are removing from your field per bale uh, to give you an idea of how many uh, pounds that you'd have to replace uh, if you're using compost or other fertilizers. 
so that wraps up my talk. Uh, so I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you for that talk, uh, Spencer. Yep. Very helpful and uh, encourage anyone. We have we have time here, so submit your questions in the Q and A uh, box in the bottom. Type them in, and we'll we'll get them answered with Spencer here. I've got one for you to start with, uh, Spencer. Uh, you were showing the alfalfa. Uh, crude protein and fiber contents uh, as quality indicators. And I'm just curious if the varieties that were higher quality were lower yielding, is there's often a trade off there? Or it, maybe I was trying to keep track from slide to slide, maybe the higher quality ones were also higher yielding? Um, we haven't specifically determined uh, the total tonnage versus the crude protein. Um, ratio uh, to determine which varieties we're doing the best yet. Uh, but that is a, a question that we need to to narrow down just because you have better crude, crude protein doesn't mean you have a lot of it uh, right. per acre. So uh, that'll be our next step. Good a uh, question from Damien. What base temperature did you use to calculate the growing degree days? So we decided to use um, the Celsius as our uh, method um, and so we used zero degrees um, as the base temperature um, and so anything above that uh, you would get you know if it was five degrees out you would get five growing degree days. Um, it's a little bit simpler than the Fahrenheit system uh, to keep track of um, and also we used uh, soil temperature as a, a determination um, since you can get some growing degree days in the winter, uh, we decided that the soil temperature had to be above freezing for metabolism. Um, and so uh, that really put the beginning of growing degree days in late February uh, for both years. Good. Another question from Damien is, was the leaf analysis on green leaves only or was it green and dry leaves included in that? So we excluded um, any dead leaves uh, or yeah, uh, dry leaves from the material uh, and we just clipped off the leaf at the collar um, per tiller. Oh, another question here from Thomas. Spencer, you have compared alternate row grass legume seeding versus mixing grass and legume within the row or alternating paired uh, legume and grass rows? What was the arrangement? Uh, the arrangement was alternating on 12 inch spacings. Uh, we didn't do any pairing yet. Uh, this was kind of our first foray into doing all of this. And so we stuck with uh, alternating rows. Um, we've got some trials that we've planted um, looking at road types, so whether it's one Kernza to every three alfalfa or other legume, um, but this specific trial was only alternating. Good. I've got another question for you then. You talked about scene point there at the end. I think a lot of people probably aren't familiar with scene point. Can you <coughs> tell us a little bit about the, the difference between scene point and alfalfa and how that might play out in, in intercropping? Yeah. So sandpoint, um, the difference between sandpoint and alfalfa is this bloating characteristic. Um, <clears throat> they, they're both used for forage, um, but at high rates, alfalfa can lead to bloating, uh, which is fatal to cows. Sandpoint has these reduced tannins that uh, can prevent bloating, but the total herbage uh, yield is lower uh, in similar environments. Um, but it also produces, sandpoint anyway, it produces large seeds. Uh, and so we're interested in <clears throat> making those seeds a, an edible crop as well. Um, and so this is our first year in, in testing the hypothesis that you can grow Kernza and sandpoint at the same time and hopefully have the, the seeds from both species uh, mature at the same rate uh, and harvest both. Could you talk a little bit about the uh, idea of inner row harvesting? You familiar with uh, you guys' plan on that? Yeah, so there's a hypothesis out there that you could 
um, mow or otherwise uh, remove the alfalfa uh, off the field without harming the Kernza, whether it's in the spring or the summer. Um, but that would require wider rows between or wider spacings between Kernza so you can get uh, a machine that's large enough to go in there um, and, and collect it. Um, we haven't quite, we haven't tested that uh, it's cropping system yet on, on mowing the alfalfa between the rows yet, um, but it, it's in the works. Great, thank you for that presentation, Spencer. Right. Thank you. you. Stop sharing your screen, we'll move on to our next talk, that's great. There is one more question, Spencer, if you wanna, um, jump onto the Q&A okay. and, and answer that. Thanks, everyone. Um, next, we have Christy Purcell from the Cannon River Watershed Pr Partnership is gonna present. Christy lives in Northfield, Minnesota, among a community of conservation-minded members, including farmers, whom she is happy to support in her role as executive director of the Cannon River Watershed Partnership. Her work with Kernza is a partnership with the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Department of Ag, um, local farmers, imminent brewing, the Cannon Valley Artisan Grain Network, and her additional groups and individuals. Her passion is bringing people together to find grassroots solutions to community issues. Thanks, Tessa. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. Really appreciate the invitation to present. Is my volume okay? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I just would like to give a little bit of an overview about um, our organization. Um, it was really interesting to hear um, particularly Carmen's presentation about um, cooperatives. Um, I think we as a nonprofit are doing a little bit of, um, of some of that work on a very local scale. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I have a very brief presentation and um, just want to allow a lot of time for, for um, questions and, and dialogue. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is our nonprofit's uh, mission statement, we partner with people and organizations to value, protect, and improve the Cannon River watershed's land and water. And I put a small um, map of the state of Minnesota so that you're able to see uh, where our watershed's geography is. So we're in southeastern Minnesota, um, and then our river um, system feeds into the Mississippi River south of the Twin Cities. So this is a picture just from a couple of weeks ago out on the Cannon River. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is our vision statement as an organization. We envision a community that creates and protects a watershed with healthy soils, drinkable groundwater, and clean, fishable, and swimmable rivers, lakes, and streams. Um, we have quite a diversified watershed. The western portion um, is a lakes region. Um, it's fairly dry and flat with a lot of agriculture in the southern part of the watershed. Um, and then as we, as the river gets closer to the Mississippi, we get into a karst uh, geology area. So really quite a varied um, uh, geology and um, water systems throughout. So just as a little bit of a frame of reference about how our organization actually operates. So we are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. We have a membership. So um, people can, can donate uh, financially, they can donate their time. Um, we are 30 years old this year. Um, we were founded in 1990. Currently we have a 13 member board of directors. Um, that's our governing body. We have three staff, but we also do have contract staff. We've got volunteers, we have student workers. Um, the town of Northfield, Minnesota uh, has two liberal arts colleges in it, St. Olaf College and Carleton College. So we um, have a great partnership with the colleges to be able to um, have student summer interns and student workers. And then our core values are resilience, equity, and engagement. 
So our uh, Kernza journey, our Kernza story started, um, we first um, got a grant to do some research out um, in two different places in the watershed, working with two farmers to plant a total of 15 acres. That was all the grain we were able to get a hold of in 2018 um, through the University of Minnesota. So we were able to um, get our hands on equivalent of 15 acres worth of Kernza seed, partnered with these two farmers, and we're doing a trial, um, a research trial with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, trying to graze Kernza and then take a seed harvest from, um, from that. So um, you can see here some cows at one of the farms uh, in Goodhue, Minnesota, um, and the farmer there is in that bottom left photo. Um, he's the guy in the gray shirt. You'll see him a few times. So that's our partnering farmer, Caleb Anderson. And um, the, the guy in the blue shirt is on this call. Um, he's CRWP's um, conservation program manager, Alan Kraus. So he was out there um, getting the machinery already. The red tractor photo in the bottom right is our other cooperating farmer, Dan Honkin, and he is in Rice County a little bit closer to the um, town of Faribault. So um, where they planted was pretty different. Um, Dan's land was a little bit lower lying, Caleb's was a little bit higher, so as far as um, conditions to plant. Um, they also had two different seeds to plant. One um, was a, a variety that came from the Land Institute, was, the, was bred in Kansas. One had been bred a couple of uh, times, I think, by the University of Minnesota, so perhaps a little more um, cold hardy and um, used to some more water. So um, they, as you might imagine, had a little bit different results. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll stay back on that slide for a moment. So um, Caleb Anderson's uh, planting, which he had the Minnesota variety and he had a little bit more upland, um, did pretty well. The um, grain that was planted that wasn't quite as um, Minnesota tolerant um, that was planted lower. We had such a difficult um, both fall and spring that year. A lot of um, thawing and then refreezing and with the low where the land was um, was really really hard on the crop itself. So um, Dan was not able to pull a crop from his field that um, the first year, last year in 2019. And so um, we were able to get him some additional seed and so he um, has replanted, but in a different location. So a lot of trial and error happening here too. Um, so that initial uh, partnership with the Department of Agriculture and with the University of Minnesota Agronomy Department um, was really great. And then our plan was the, you know, questions that Brandon was bringing up, well, then what happens if, if we're able to um, produce some seed, what happens to it? You know, we don't want to leave these farmers high and dry who are taking a risk, um, who are partnering with us to do some research. Um, Caleb's first year uh, in 2019, he had a contract with the University of Minnesota where they would purchase um, his seed for their seed increase program. But uh, after last year, he didn't have a place to sell um, and um, Dan would have had that same issue in 2019 but because of his crop failure um, also in 2020 both of these farmers are going to be looking for a place to um, sell their grain so us as a local um, a local cooperator and a local uh, partner with these farmers with the Department of Ag with the University University of Minnesota. Um, we wrote a grant to Patagonia, the clothing brand. They also have Patagonia Provisions. Um, I saw yesterday a lot of our partners were presenting. So Patrick Horn um, and also our local Patagonia store um, were very interested in this project and they've been talking about it a lot internally in their um, organization. So um, we were able to host um, we were able to buy grain, not from our uh, two local farmers, but we were able to buy other Minnesota grown Kernza um, with the grant from Patagonia and provide it to the brewery in town, Imminent Brewing, which Tessa mentioned in my introduction. 
and uh, the brewery wanted to do a little bit of, of trial with the grain before they brewed a huge batch of it. And so they were able to share some of the grain with um, some home brewers you can see in sort of the upper left photo. In November, actually, um, they provided kerns of grain to the local home brewing club. And there, I think, were six different um, beers made with varying percentages of Kernza. So these homebrewers came up with their own recipes, they brewed it right on the premise, and then they were able to ferment it, just keeping this inside the brewery. So then at our uh, December event um, that you see some pictures of, we were able to have a tasting. So a lot of people came out for free beer and to talk about Kernza. Um, and Dr. Jake Youngers, um, who you heard from a couple of different days, I think, um, in this seminar, um, was so kind as to present kind of a, an overall primer of, here's what Kernza is, here's sort of the history of it, here's you know, what we're excited about. So um, that partnership with the University of Minnesota was really lovely there. Um, and then you can see our panelists in the center picture here. Some folks you've also heard from previous days and some folks who are on the call today. Um, so we've got uh, Dr. Youngers on the end, um, one of the brewers, um, this middle picture here. So there's Jake, there's Stefan Vanderwall. He's one of the brewers at the brewery and also home brewer. This is our farmer, Caleb Anderson and Goodhue. This is our farmer, Dan Honkin. Um, by Fairbo, Christopher Abbott of Sprout Labs and Perennial Pantry, who you heard from just yesterday, and Colin Puritan from the University of Minnesota Forever Green Institute. So um, Connie Carlson, who's also on this call, has been a great partner from um, the Forever Green Institute, was unable to make it because December in Minnesota weather. Uh, but um, it was really great. We had just this incredible turnout and people really learned a lot about Kernza at this event. So kind of the second half of um, that event. So once um, we had little scorecards for people who got to taste the different beers and um, then the brewery took that information and made their own recipe and they made an, a German alt style beer with the Kernza. The brewers were so excited. They were talking about how they'd want, they had wanted to brew this style of beer before and just the, the flavors and the nuttiness of the Kernza um, really added to the flavor profile that they were going for. Super enthusiastic. Um, they did have some leftover grain, which we got to a local baker. Um, so you can see the crackers on the counter in that picture on the left. So um, our local baker, Martha, from Martha's Eats and Treats in Dundas, Minnesota, was really excited. Um, she keeps asking me for more Kernza now that we got her some to experiment with. She made some delicious crackers. And then we did buy some um, Kerns of clusters from the Birchwood Cafe in um, Minneapolis as well. You can see in the bottom the swag table from Patagonia. So they were a sponsor of the second event, which was a film event we call uh, Downstream Film Festival. This was the fifth year that we had done a film event um, in Northfield. Um, when Patrick came from California, he brought some Kerns of beer that Patagonia um, brewed two different varieties and we were able to do door prizes and give away that Patagonia swag and um, including the beer. So um, we really have a lot of partners in this work and our work is really multifaceted. So doing um, education and outreach to our local community, the people drinking um, Kernza or eating the Kernza. Um, there was some interest from uh, farmers who'd heard about Kernza who were able to come to these events, talk with other farmers who are already growing them, um, potential investors. Um, we have a lot of great local sponsorships. So that little blue square is some of our local partners, including the food co-op in town. Um, so uh, they are really interested in local food, of course, and supporting local farmers as are we. Um, partnering with the colleges. So Carleton College sponsored that first, that COWS event in December, Conversations on the Wonders of Science. And then they, um, our Downstream Film Festival event, we did um, in partnership with their Climate Action Week of events that they all do on campus. Um, some just primarily for students and some students and the public. Um, I wanna just check my notes. Oh, another way we're, um, we're partnering, which is brand new through the University of Minnesota, is through the Regional Sustainable Development Partnership. So um, 
that's kind of regionally around Minnesota, and we just received a grant to support um, our continued work with Kernza trying to target farmers who are growing in drinking water supply management areas um, because we we are have seen and continue to be optimistic about the potential that um, this deep rooted plant has both for water quality because um, pretty much all of our watershed residents um, drink groundwater. So um, to have Kernza growing in the groundwater protection areas is really exciting and we'd like to um, get more farmers to grow. And then if we're really targeting folks who are growing um, in the area that can also protect drinking water, then win-win. Um, let's see, what other partners have I not mentioned? Um, yeah, I think we, um, CRWP, our organization has, has joined this Cannon Valley Artisan Grain Network group um, that I think was started by Renewing the Countryside. Um, there are other farmers in our area that are growing Kernza. It's the two farmers as part of this um, Minnesota Department of Agriculture um, research project that we partner with, but it's really nice to be able to join the Artisan Grain um, Network because then we can be in coordination with some of the other farms growing locally. Um, certainly a piece of this whole process, um, trying to keep it local, so having the, the grain grown locally, having you know people being able to taste um, and consume and purchase locally, really it's sort of that middle piece that um, the, the Artisan Grains Network and just some of the other partners that you've heard from, um, like uh, Sprout Labs and Perennial Pantry, um, trying to fill in the gap of, well, how do we get from the farmer growing it and harvesting it, then what? You know, we need to get it to that food grade quality that um, Carmen was talking about that the um, co-ops um, hopefully will be um, kind of an aggregate, a way to get local partners to be able to pool their resources and um, invest locally. So. Um, some movement is happening locally on that um, for small grains in general, but we're we're hoping to stay involved and make sure that Kearns is part of that conversation. Before I move on to questions, I just love to end all of my presentations with this quote from Luna Leopold. Aldo Leopold was quoted uh, earlier today. Uh, and, and of course, as an organization, we know that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. So as our um, as a clean water nonprofit, it's so important for us that we're working with farmers. We want to make sure farmers are um, staying on the land, making sure they're able to be profitable, and they are really some of our greatest um, partners um, in this work for clean water. Uh, our, our watershed is largely agricultural. There are um, towns, kind of smallish communities. So. Um, we know we know we need to, to work with the, the landowners and the farmers in our area. And we try to do that to the end of uh, end result of clean water. So uh, I'd be happy to take questions. I wanted to leave it really open ended to see where people had questions or comments. I think this is Caleb um, harvesting his crop uh, last year in 2019 for um, for that seed increase program at the University of Minnesota. But um, be happy to take questions or if people want to follow up with me. I guess I didn't put my email address on here, but be happy to provide that as well. Great, Christy. Thank you for that presentation. Great to hear about the work you guys have going. Um, certainly invite anyone to type in a question at the Q&A or even if you want to uh, talk, we can promote you if you want to have more of a conversation. Um, that'd be great too. Um, invited anyone to, to jump in that way. Uh, let us know in the chat or, or in the Q&A button that um, you're interested in talking. So um, I almost came up for the beer event, uh, but ended up being busy then. But uh, uh, do, do you think that there would be interest in, in continuing to make uh, beer, kinds of beer products in the future if, if you have an availability? Is that basically what's, what's holding you back at this point? Yes, I think um, 
So we had talked about for my presentation to be able to have um, the brewery owners on, but because they're in the process of reinventing their business model yet again, because they were closed and it was takeout only. And so this is not a great time for them. Um, but I did try to get the response from them. Um, we are really fortunate um, where Imminent Brewing is, is here in Northfield where my office and where I live. Um, they're incredibly community minded. Uh, the nickname for their um, th for their business is Northfield Living Room. So of course it's been a big shift where people have not been able to actually go to that brewery, but they are so enthusiastic. They feel like um, they try to buy you know local berries if they're doing a berry beer. They try to buy local hops when they're able, which is kind of tough in this climate, um, but to have the potential to have a local grain because they use so much grain in their brewing process. They were really excited um, and willing to partner and they continue to be really excited. Um, they're already talking about, you know, well, what kind of a beer could we do next year? And especially if they can support some of the farmers that they know, they've heard talk, they've had conversations to be able to buy um, directly from their neighbors and really keep it local. Um, you know, for us, we we want all parts of that process to remain local, just for um, economic development, just for the you know health of the water, just for relationship purposes. So there is definitely an appetite from this particular brewery. Um, there are other brewers that who have reached out to us, or we've had conversations with them who are a little bit further afield, either just outside the watershed or other breweries in the watershed. Um, and there are brewers who are excited. They, um, there's a lot of buzz around our events and around the beer itself. And so um, there is additional interest, certainly. Um, but we'll just kind of see, I think, some things that are holding us back. It is still pretty unknown, of course, for growers, for brewers, and then how we kind of link them up and how we're able to link them up. So um, we're, we're hopeful that maybe we can continue to um, uh, get funding for us to help work on that demand side because we're able to to help work on the on the production side with the regional sustainable development partnership and um, forever green institute and those kinds of um, uh, institutions also curious about uh, what the farmers what in the case that it did establish well um, the farmers feel like they, they could sense that the the perennial grass covering the ground would, would be helping water quality of the river or um, is this kind of visible effect that, that you can see or, or is it harder to, to kind of grasp that? Um, I mean, we reached out to these two farmers in particular because we know they are very conservation minded. They're really wanting to do something for um, soil health, for water quality, um, and because they're grazers, um, we know that, I mean, I think when Caleb spoke at the second event we had in February, you know, for his calculation, um, you know, Kernza was worth it to him already without even um, selling the grain just because of the quality forage he, he had for his cattle. Um, now we don't have that many grazers. There's a lot of row crop, so corn and soy in our uh, watershed and in our area but as far as you know having folks graze there are some resources I think the university has where you can put yourself on a map to say um, you know I don't have cattle but I do have forage and, and you know folks could bring their cattle or vice versa um, so there are are opportunities even if people aren't grazers um, but those those farmers were particularly excited about that um, that opportunity for them and they just want to do everything they can for climate, for water, for soil health. Right, great. I don't see any questions popping up right now. So I think this is going to wrap us up for, for today and for the whole meeting, uh, everybody. Um, it's, it's been, it's been an unusual experience. I, I, I found it to be, uh, um, you know, exciting to have, 50 to 80 people on here almost every day and, and lots of participants. Um, it's been been excellent. Uh, I think we're going to have them 
uh, online pretty soon, the rest of them, right, Tessa? Uh, what, where can that, what, what, what's the place to go for those? Um, so you'll be able to find them with timestamps and, um, and the final agenda and all of that kind of stuff at kernza.org um, by the end of the week. And in the meantime, some of them are already posted. You know, if you search the Land Institute YouTube, their days one and two are on there and days three and four are soon to be uploaded. And Great. So. Great. I want to thank you, Tessa, for jumping in and helping make this possible. So um, it would, would have been very hard for me to, to, to make this jump from uh, in person to, to online. So um, thank you very much for, for helping us to, to, to do this. Um, it really was really smooth. Uh, it was a re great relief to me <laughs> that, that it was so smooth. Um, thanks to all of our presenters uh, for, for presenting over this uh, the last uh, uh, seven days and, um, and for all of you that attended. And it, you know, I think both Dustin and I would say that if you have any questions, you want to learn more and want to connect with us, um, email or call us anytime. We're, we're excited to, to make those connections and connect you with other people in your area or just learn about what might be possible. Um, usually at the end of these, uh, we talk about next year. Um, next year is still uncertain, so uh, we, we'll see. But certainly if you, you want to give a, a comment to us about what you'd like to see in next year's meeting, where you, if you want to offer to host it, uh, hey, let us know. Um, I think you have a great location. Um, or we'll, maybe we'll be in Kansas. We'll, we'll see what we do next year. But certainly keep posted um, around uh, January-ish uh, to start planning and registering for, for next year's conference. Anything else you'd like to say, Tessa? No, just thank you to everyone who presented and thank you to everyone who listened. Um, hopefully, hopefully it was a way to keep folks engaged in the community um, despite the challenging travel issues that we currently are experiencing. Great. Happy harvesting turns, everyone. Um, I'm going to go out and, and take some data. <laughs> Time to get back to work. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you all.